Uh, early on, I had said that basically our goal is to understand uh, the kind of devices we need for uh, realizing amplifiers and take the most popular devices that are around today and see how to make amplifiers with them. But if you do encounter other devices, people may invent some new ones or maybe some old ones will come back into fashion. You should be able to uh, also design circuits for them. And also if you, let us say, happen to investigate devices, you should also be able to figure out what kind of characteristics the devices must have so that uh, you can make good amplifiers, okay. So just as an example, just as examples, we can look at the other devices that are available. So the very first amplifying device was the triode. So essentially all these characteristics are like ID versus VDS, okay. Now so this is what it looks like. On the X axis we have the equivalent of VDS and on the Y axis the equivalent of ID, okay. And these uh, curves are parameterized for different values of the gate voltage or gate source voltage equivalent. Now, first of all, you can see that this by itself does not look anything like the MOS characteristic, okay. In fact, it looks the curves are uh, curves have a substantial slope and if you recall the MOS characteristics, so this is how they are, okay, in the triode region and after that they go off into saturation. And this is actually the reason this point, is, this region is called the triode region, okay, because the triode device has characteristics resembling that, okay. But the point is, I mean, the, this was still an amplifier because there is some control from the gate voltage, okay. So you go on changing the gate voltage, the current will change. So that is what gives you control, right. You change something here and you something else changes there and the amount of power you have to put in to change something here is less than the amount of change in power you get at that port, then it will be a useful device. That is what power amplification is all about, okay. And it was that. But it was not great, so people kept on improving it. So I do not know if uh, any of you have, have you seen vacuum tubes anywhere, really old radios or uh, pictures, no? Huh? Black and white pictures. <laughs> I think the color pictures of vacuum tube for sure, yeah, heard of them. Yeah, so basically there are uh, uh, electrodes separated by some gap in vacuum and if you heat one of the electrodes, electrons will be fired from that to the other and uh, you can make a diode, you can also make an amplifying device by having some conductor in between them which controls the amount of electrons, the number of electrons that actually reach the other plate and so on, okay. Or you can read about them, I mean there are lots of uh, resources online to do that. And people kept improving it, essentially it involved putting more and more electrodes in the vacuum tube and this is what is known as a pentode which is sort of the end of the line. There was a triode and a tetrode with four electrodes and a pentode with five electrodes, okay. Now you can see this looks quite a bit like the MOS transistor, right. So you have uh, and again this is the uh, ID versus VDS, the equivalent of that, okay. The only difference you see, what difference you see? Yeah, the voltages are very high. I think uh, we would not even go to like 1 percent of this voltage normally these days, okay. So here if you can read this, this point here is 400 volts, okay. So this was common. I mean if you look at uh, really old radios, if you, somebody has them and uh, so you will have very high voltages, okay. But you can see the common theme that the amplifying device does look like this, right, in its output characteristics. And this is of course NMOS, something that is very familiar to us and this is some device that we use for some of in our, some of our ICs and I just simulated the characteristics. It looks like the characteristics that you are familiar with. And if you take a bipolar transistor, again it looks like that except you can see that for very small VCs, you can see that the VC sat here is 0.2 volts or that much, okay. This is some sort of idealized uh, one and then this is some real MOS transistor that is available, okay, ID versus VDS of that. What difference do you see between this and the other characteristics that I showed or whatever we have drawn in class? 
it does not look like square law for equal increments in uh, gate voltages gate source voltages you should get larger and larger increments it does not look like that. This is because of some parasitic effects in the transistor you could have extra resistances and so on. So, because of that this happens ok and this is actually a relatively high current device you can see that this is an ampere this is a 1 ampere here. So, in that case a very small uh, resistance can cause a substantial voltage drop and roughly speaking it will act like source degeneration and it will essentially linearize the device whatever is square law has become more linear right because if you go from 4 to 5 to 6 the change in current is almost equal okay. and this is I d uh, versus V g s characteristics in saturation region of the same thing ok. It also shows you like what happens at different temperatures. So, you can see that the mobility falls at higher temperature and rises at lower temperature whereas, the threshold voltage it is uh, highest at very low temperatures and it decreases as you go up in temperature ok. Anyway, all this is general information you can just look up all these things on the web, but now you should be able to understand this I mean not just look at it. But now, there are some supposedly futuristic fets which will uh, futuristic devices people are working on it because uh, the reason for such tremendous progress in VLSI has been uh, part of the reason is also that uh, the devices have been uh, shrunk continuously ok they have got smaller and smaller. So, that means they have got faster and also you can put a larger number of devices in the in a given area. So, the functional complexity of chips is uh, enormous compared to what it was earlier. Have you heard of Cray C R A Y a company no what is it? Yeah, they were the first ones to make this supercomputers by using uh, all kinds of parallelism and so on. They also had all kinds of thing. I mean, you have seen Jurassic Park, right? No, it does it uses many crays, does not it? Or if you read the novel, I think it claims that engine is the biggest customer of crays at that time or some nonsense like that. But <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, that had they had all kinds of optimizations. Uh, also, that whole thing was arranged in a hexagon so that the wiring distances could be minimized and so on. But anyway that is not the point I think that today the processor in your mobile phone is much more powerful than the Cray Super's computer the first ones ok. So, that is the progress in 30 years or so that we have had. But there is a concern now that uh, we cannot go on shrinking any further because right now already the gate oxide that layer thickness is about 10 atoms or less or something. So, obviously like the, there is a natural discretization right you cannot shrink any smaller than atomic dimensions. So, uh, uh, there is already a concern that it would not scale and it is actually becoming very expensive also. So, people are working on uh, alternative devices and one of them you may have heard the term graphene at least right. So, that is uh, this is some device now with some imagination you could believe that this looks like a most characteristic, <laughs> but uh, anyway uh, the people who do investigate graphene uh, transistors would like it to look like most characteristics right and there is a very good reason for it we know y 2 2 has to be 0, y 2 1 has to be large that is all it does not matter what device you make. Uh, you could choose another set of parameters, but whatever it is in some domain it has to look like this. So, that is what they are trying to do ok. And this I just searched organic transistors in Google I mean do not worry about the details, but you can see mass like characteristics right. So, they are all organic transistors of some variety or the other. I use some organic components I do not know much more than that. Okay. <laughs> I think there are uh, so the one of the uh, silicon this uh, silicon substrate on which you uh, on which you make ICs that is basically a single silicon crystal right you cannot have any defects in it then all the stuff that you learn does not work like that ok mobility will reduce substantially and so on. So, that is why it is actually highly purified and the labs in which you make these things are also really really clean ok. So, there is a measure of cleanliness it is number of particles per 100 cubic feet or something like that and in the most modern one there will be less than 1 or something of the sort less than 0 0.1. So, it is a really really clean and if you go to our devices lab it is also a clean environment I mean not to the same level as that, but it will be class 100 or something of the sort. So, anyway that is one of the reasons for its expense. So, other types of uh, transistors people are trying to make are some things that you can print on different types of substrates and so on. And there, uh, there, there is a cost to that. I mean, there is a penalty to that. Their mobility is very bad. It's probably like one thousandth or one ten thousandth of uh, what you get from silicon. But hopefully, you can make something. 
So, one of the active areas of interest is also to make uh, electronics on a flexible substrate, so that you can bend and do all those things. So, organic is part of that, you can uh, deposit some organic stuff on flexible substrates and so on. Okay. So, it is just another choice of material. So, you can see all kinds of funky characteristics here, where the equivalent of the triode region looks different, but uh, the saturation region part, where you want to use it as an amplifier does look like that. Okay. If you plot ID versus VDS, you want to see a bunch of parallel lines, I mean that is all, <laughs> that is the bottom line. So, however you make the device, you go and use your imagination and do that. Okay. And there is another TFT, some thin film technology transistors and again you can see people are trying to get that type of characteristics. Okay. So, even if okay, I do not foresee the end of MOS for another 20 years at least, but uh, even if it ends tomorrow and some other device replaces it, you should still be in business with the same stuff that you learned. Okay. Maybe with some different symbols here and there, but besides that everything should be fine. Okay. So, that is also the important I mean advantage of learning something from basics very well okay you're not dependent on the specifics of the device right i mean you can't be oh i'm a bipolar engineer i can't design with moss you know you don't want to be like that okay uh, no there are people like that that's why i'm telling you i think uh, yeah. so but you have to i mean if you understand things from a fundamental level of course it takes uh, some time to getting used to this and you can design it just as well okay so that's about the transistor characteristics And the last thing we did was op amps and I also claimed that the input stage of the op amp that we used is widely used and every op amp will have something like this. So, this is just to show you that and it is like the city darshans with the same speed and same comprehensibility. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so this is an op amp, quad op amp means that in a single IC you have four op amps. So, that it is convenient to use right, because uh, you have power supply pins and so on. So, when you have multiple op amps in the same package, it is quite convenient to use as you will discover whether you want to or not in the next MSS lab. Okay. So, you will use these uh, op amps. So, anyway what I want to show is okay, maybe before that let me go back here. So, this is the data sheet and you can see some key things. Can you read this? Gain bandwidth product and so on. Okay. So, those are the key uh, uh, parameters of uh, transistors and this one has a really high input resistance. You can see it is a tara ohm or something, right. And yeah, I will uh, briefly talk about it. So, let me just show Okay. So, let me see if I can zoom into this. So, these are the again magnitude and phase characteristic. The magnitude part is the straight line that you see. Okay. Uh, so, basically it keeps going up and even that that pole has not been reached. Okay. So, it follows this first order behavior over a really wide range of frequencies that is what I wanted to show. Okay. In fact, it goes all the way up to some gain of million or something like that and then this is the phase okay. and you can see at when the gain crosses unity, the phase is about 50 degrees or so. I mean this is actually it should be away from 0 that is the bottom line. Okay. So, the phase margin is about 50 degrees. So, these are all things that we learned, but it is also relevant to every practical device that you see. So, anyway coming back to this op amp. So, can you recognize this? This is the internal schematic of the op amp and in fact, some of the older devices you can go and see the data sheet and uh, you should be able to by now decipher with a little bit of staring what is inside the op amp. Yeah, they are BJDs, yes. Most of the standard commercial parts that is things that have single op amp inside are still BJDs. Okay. They are old designs, there is no point redesigning them. Now, so in some key places you would use uh, MOS or some sort of field effect transistors, but this is a very old design. So, it will still use BJTs, but I mean does it look familiar or uh, not at all? Yeah? How is it related to what we did? Yeah? 
Yeah. So, you can see a PMOS dif PNP differential pair which is equivalent to PMOS, you see an NPN, NPN current mirror and so on. Okay. So, this is actually somewhat simplified, but anyway you see the point. So, if I go from here, so this is what you were asking about other day, what is what stage is this? Huh? Yeah, it is not a Darlington pair because this collector is not tied to that one, but it is just a emitter follower. Okay. So, from here to there it behaves like an emitter follower and you can also see that the bias current of Q 1 is simply the base current of Q 2. So, the input current is quite small that is the idea and it also increases the input resistance. So, you have input buffer so that you can get a high input resistance and you have a differential pair with a current mirror load and that is the entire first stage basically. And here again you have a PNP emitter follower followed by a NPN emitter follower. Okay. So, the actual second stage transistor is this one, but uh, before that you have two buffering stages. So, again if you stare at the schematic for a little while you should be able to figure out this for yourself and you can see the Miller compensation cap around the whole thing. Okay. And finally, most of these general purpose op amps are able to drive a very large current because you can operate them with a variety of loads. So, there will always be an output buffer and this one is a combination of NPN emitter follower and also a PNP emitter follower. So, that is a particular kind of stage known as class A B stage, but it is very useful because it does not always draw current, it draws current only when an output current is demanded from the op amp. Okay. So, this works this NPN stuff works for positive outputs and PNP works for negative outputs and so on. Okay. And also I mean who knows what you will do with it in the lab. So, <laughs> you could connect be connecting the output anywhere. So, most of these commercial parts also come with some overload protection. So, that you short the output to ground it should still not burn out. It will not be functioning correctly of course, but it should not burn out. So, that is why what happens is that if you short this to ground a large current will flow that will turn this one on and it will turn off the bias current and turn off the previous stages. Okay. So, it is some sort of protection. So, that is the whole stage. So, this is the input stage, this blue stuff is the second stage and this purple stuff is the third stage and this orange thing is the protection. Okay. And this also we will use, it is a it is also a quad op amp meaning there are four op amps in a single package but this is much better and in this case the input device we have not seen this, but uh, I will tell you what they are, but this is based, these transistors are equivalent of PMOS transistors. Okay. PMOS transistors with a negative threshold voltage that is all. Okay. So, as far as we are concerned we can assume that they are like that. It is another field effect transistor like the MOS transistor, it is known as junction field effect transistor, it does not have oxide and so on. But for our purposes we can assume that there are PMOS with negative V T. Okay. So, that is what I have shown here and again you can see the PMOS differential pair equivalent to the PMOS differential pair and this is a current mirror the diode connected transistor is actually shown as a diode, but it is really a diode connected transistor that is all. Okay. And you can see the second stage that is a bipolar transistor common emitter amplifier with the pole splitting capacitor across it. And finally, the buffers you have the NPN buffer emitter follower and a PNP emitter follower. Okay. Of course, this is the highly simplified schematic, this is somewhat less simplified, but you should still be able to figure out the input stage. The current mirror you can see that the current mirror has this extra buffer, this is to yesterday we briefly talked about it to eliminate the effect of base currents these bases will be drawing currents right. So, to supply that there is a uh, emitter follower there. Okay. What you need is a positive gain from collector to base and this emitter follower will give that, but this current will be very small. So, the mirroring will be much more accurate okay. and you can see again there is a buffer followed by a common source amplifier, common emitter amplifier and the pole splitting capacitor across it and finally, the output stage with protection and all that stuff. Okay. So, this is for overload protection. Anyway, you can this is a very quick tool. So, you can later look at it and try to understand what is going on. 
and sometimes you see symbols like this nothing mysterious it is simply this okay, collectors I mean three different transistors that is all you are drawing it like this sometimes I do it for compactness, but uh, just three transistors in parallel with collectors separated. And there is no so many more that you can see ok. This is uh, I mean I do not want to go on and on about this, but this one is slightly different in that the first stage is a differential pair and the second stage is another differential pair ok. It is not a just a common emitter amplifier, but there is pole splitting in the differential pair ok. So, from the positive input to the negative output you connect a capacitor. So, that you have pole splitting the rest of the stuff is uh, there is an output buffer pre buffer and the final output buffer ok. So, you can do all of these things by yourselves and in some cases even go and calculate another buffer no buffer before the last one. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, you can read and understand the data sheets by yourself it will take some time because uh, most of the time will be spent in getting past the notation and maybe some somewhat unfamiliarly drawn circuits and so on, but you should still be able to understand a lot of stuff and also the parameters that are given in the data sheet and this is quite important also to be able to do uh, things in the lab well ok. It is one thing to have an ideal op amp and you connect any value of R 1 and R 2 you get a gain of 1 plus R 1 by R 2, but uh, when you make an amplifier you have to be mindful of what you connect to it supply voltages how much current you can draw. Uh, you will see that you cannot use 1 ohms nor you can can use 10 mega ohms you will have to use some more reasonable values what the reasonable stuff is you figure out using the data sheet ok. So, that brings us to the very end and I am sure you are all very happy but uh, wait a few more minutes that is all. So, this is what I advertised as the goals of the course I think we have gone through all of this small signal analysis, analysis of nonlinearity and frequency response and also stabilization of uh, feedback circuits and I think in parallel you also had this control systems and solid state devices. So, that should give you like extra information in those directions and like stability as well as the device physics part ok. And as well as design we saw all the single stage amplifier topologies and basically more complex circuits are made by combining these single stage amplifier topologies and sometimes we have some special things like the differential pair ok which is used as a unit. And we also saw essentially all varieties of biasing techniques ok. So, I said you should understand this hopefully you do ok and I will have a tutorial uh, which uh, will be discussed on Monday or Tuesday and that should help you do this as well ok. And applications I mean it is a long shot that we would be able to cover it we did not do that, but the rest of the stuff we have done. And thanks to all the army of the TS for conducting the course anyway that is the end of the course have fun all the best ok. Thanks.